Section thirty seven being chapter ten, parts three and four of a history of Greece to the death of Alexander the Great, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 10, Part 3, The Theban Attack on Plataea. The declaration of war between the two great states of Greece was a signal to smaller states to profit by the situation for the gratification of their private enmities. On a dark, moonless night, in the early spring, a band of three hundred Thebans entered Plataea, invited and admitted by a small party in the city. Instead of at once attacking the chiefs of the party which supported the Athenian alliance, they took up their post in the Agora, and made a proclamation calling upon the Plataeans to join the Boeotian League. The Plataeans, as a people, with the exception of a few malcontents, were cordially attached to Athens, but they were surprised, and in the darkness of the night exaggerated the numbers of the Thebans. They acceded to the Theban demand, but in the course of negotiations discovered how few the enemies were. Breaking down the party walls between their houses, so as not to attract notice by moving in the streets, they concerted a plan of action. When all was arranged, they barricaded the streets leading to the Agora with wagons, and then attacked the enemy before dawn. The Thebans were soon dispersed. They lost their way in the strange town, and wandered about, pelted by women from the housetops, through narrow streets deep in mud, for heavy rain had fallen during the night. A few clambered up the city wall and cast themselves down on the other side, but the greater number rushed through the door of a large building, mistaking it for one of the town gates, and were thus captured alive by the Plataeans. A few escaped, who reached an unguarded gate and cut the wooden bolt with an axe which a woman gave them. The three hundred were only the vanguard of a large Theban force, which was advancing slowly in the rain along the eight miles of road which lay between Thebes and Plataea. They were delayed by the crossing of the swollen Asipus River, and they arrived too late. The Plataeans sent out a herald to them, requiring them to do no injury to Plataean property outside the walls if they valued the lives of the Theban prisoners. According to the Theban account, the Plataeans definitely promised to restore the prisoners when the troops evacuated their territory. But the Plataeans afterwards denied this, and said that they merely promised, without the sanction of an oath, to restore the prisoners in case they came to an agreement after negotiation. It matters little. The Plataeans, as soon as they had conveyed all their property into the city, put their prisoners to death, 180 in number. Even on their own showing, they were clearly guilty of an act of ill faith, which is explained by the deep hatred existing between the two states. A message had been immediately sent to Athens. The Athenians seized all the Boeotians in Attica, and sent a herald to Plataea, bidding them not to injure their prisoners, but the herald found the Thebans dead. The Athenians immediately set Plataea ready for a siege. They provisioned it with corn, removed the women, children, and old men, and sent a garrison of eighty Athenians. The Theban attack on Plataea was a glaring violation of the Thirty Years' Peace, and it hastened the outbreak of the war. Greece was now in a state of intense excitement at the approaching struggle of the two leading cities. Oracles flew about, and a recent earthquake in Delos was supposed to be significant. Public opinion was generally favourable to the Lacedaemonians, who seemed to be the champions of liberty against a tyrannical city. Both sides meditated enlisting the aid of Persia. The Lacedaemonians negotiated with the states of Italy and Sicily for the purpose of obtaining a large navy to crush the Athenians. But this scheme also fell through. The cities of the West were too busy with their own political interests to send ships and money to old Greece. Athens, indeed, had also cast her eyes westward, and when she embraced the alliance of Corcyra, she seems to have been forming connections with Sicily. 
At all events, in the same year, ambassadors of Regium and Leontini appeared together at Athens, and at the same meeting of the assembly, alliances were renewed with both cities on the proposal of Callias. The object of Chalcidian Leontini was doubtless to gain support against Corinthian Syracuse, while the motive of Regium may have been connected with the affairs of Thurii, the rebellious daughter of Athens herself. But these alliances led to no action of Athens in the west for six years to come. Part 4. The Plague When the corn was ripe, in the last days of May, King Archidamus, with two-thirds of the Peloponnesian army, invaded Attica. From the Isthmus he had sent on Melesippus to Athens, if even at the last hour the Athenians might yield. But Pericles had persuaded them to receive no embassies once the enemy were in the field. The envoy had to leave the borders of Attica before the sun set. And Thucydides, after the manner of Herodotus, marks the formal commencement of the war by repeating the impressive words which Melesippus uttered as he stood on the frontier. This day will be the beginning of many woes to the Greeks. Archidamus then laid siege to Enoe, a fortress on Mount Kitharon, but failed to take it and his delay gave the Athenians time to complete their preparations. They brought into the city their family and their goods, while their flocks and herds were removed to the island of Euboea. The influx of the population into the city caused terrible crowding. A few had the homes of their friends, but the majority pitched their tents in the vacant spaces, and housed themselves, as the peace party bitterly said, in barrels and vultures' nests. They seized temples and shrines, and even the ancient enclosure of the Pelagicon on the northwest of the Acropolis was occupied, though its occupation was deprecated by a dark oracle. Subsequently the crowding was relieved when the Piraeus and the space between the long walls were utilized. Archidamus first ravaged the plain of Eleusis and Thria. He then crossed into the Cephissian plain by the pass between Mounts Aigalios and Parnes, and halted under Parnes in the deme of Acarnae, whence he could see in the distance the Acropolis of Athens. The proximity of the invaders caused great excitement in Athens, and roused furious opposition to Pericles, who would not allow the troops to go forth against them, except a few flying columns of horse in the immediate neighbourhood of the city. Pericles had been afraid that Archidamus, who was his personal friend, might spare his property either from friendship or policy, so he took the precaution of declaring to his fellow citizens that he would give his lands to the people if they were left unravaged. The invader presently advanced northward between Parnes and Pentelicus to Decalia, and proceeded through the territory of Oropus to Boeotia. The Athenians, meanwhile, had been operating by sea. They had sent a hundred ships round the Peloponnesus. An attack on Methone on the Messenian coast failed. The place was saved by a daring Spartan officer, Brasidas, who by this exploit began a distinguished career. But the fleet was more successful further north. The important island of Cephalenia was won over, and some towns on the Acarnanian coast were taken. Measures were also adopted for the protection of Euboea against the Locrians of the opposite mainland. The epic Namidian town of Thronion was captured, and the desert island of Atalanta, over against Opus, was made a guard station. More important was the drastic measure which Athens adopted against her subject and former rivals, the Dorians of Aegina. She felt that they were not to be trusted, and the security of her positions in the Saronic Gulf was of the first importance. So she drove out the Aeginetans, and settled the island with a clerarchy of her own citizens. Aegina thus became, like Salamis, annexed to Attica. Just as the Messenian exiles had been befriended by Athens, and given a new home, so the Aeginetan exiles were now befriended by Sparta, and were settled in the region of Thyriatis, in the north of Laconia. Thyriatis was the Lacedaemonian answer to Naupactus. When Archidamus left Attica, Pericles consulted for emergencies of the future by setting aside a reserve fund of money and a reserve armament of ships. There had been as much as 9,700 talents in the treasury, but the expenses of the buildings on the Acropolis and of the war at Potidaea had reduced this to 6,000. 
it was now decreed that one thousand talents of this amount should be reserved, not to be touched unless the enemy were to attack Athens by sea, and that every year one hundred triremes should be set apart with the same object. In winter the Athenians, following an old custom, celebrated the public burial of those who had fallen in the war. The bones were laid in ten cedar boxes, and were buried outside the walls in the Keramicus. An empty bed, covered with a pall, was carried for those whose bodies were missing. Pericles pronounced the funeral panegyric. It has not been preserved, but the spirit and general argument of it have been reproduced in the oration which Thucydides, who must have been one of the audience, has put in his mouth. It is a rare good fortune to possess a picture drawn by a Pericles and a Thucydides of the ideal Athens which Pericles dreamed of creating. There is no exclusiveness, he said, in our public life and in our private intercourse. We are not suspicious of one another, nor angry with our neighbour if he does what he likes. We do not put on sour looks at him, which, though harmless, are not pleasant. And we have not forgotten to provide for our weary spirits many relaxations from toil. We have regular games and sacrifices throughout the year. At home the style of our life is refined, and the delight which we daily feel in all these things helps to banish melancholy. Because of the greatness of our city, the fruits of the whole earth flow in upon us, so that we enjoy the goods of other countries as freely as of our own. Then again our military training is in many respects superior to that of our adversaries. Our city is thrown open to the world, and we never expel a foreigner, or prevent him from seeing or learning anything, of which the secret, if revealed to an enemy, might profit him. We rely not upon management or trickery, but upon our own hearts and hands. And in the matter of education, whereas they from early youth are always undergoing laborious exercises which are to make them brave, we live at ease, and yet are equally ready to face the perils which they face. If we prefer to meet danger with a light heart, but without laborious training, and with a courage which is gained by habit and not enforced by law, are we not greatly the gainers? Since we do not anticipate the pain, although, when the hour comes, we can be as brave as those who never allow themselves to rest. And thus, too, our city is equally admirable in peace and in war. For we are lovers of the beautiful, yet simple in our tastes, and we cultivate the mind without loss of manliness. Wealth we employ not for talk and ostentation, but when there is a real use for it. To avow poverty with us is no disgrace. The true disgrace is in doing nothing to avoid it. An Athenian citizen does not neglect the state, because he takes care of his own household. And even those of us who are engaged in business have a very fair idea of politics. We alone regard a man who takes no interest in public affairs, not as a harmless, but as a useless character, and if few of us are originators, we are all sound judges of a policy. The great impediment to action is, in our opinion, not discussion, but the want of that knowledge which is gained by discussion preparatory to action, for we have a peculiar power of thinking before we act, and of acting too whereas other men are courageous from ignorance, but hesitate upon reflection. Then the speaker goes on to describe Athens as the centre of Hellenic culture, and to claim that the individual Athenian in his own person seems to have the power of adapting himself to the most varied forms of action with the utmost versatility and grace. And he continues, We shall assuredly not be without witnesses. There are mighty monuments of our power, which will make us the wonder of this and of succeeding ages. We shall not need the praises of Homer, or any other panegyrist, whose poetry may please for the moment, although his representation of the facts will not bear the light of day. For we have compelled every land and every sea to open a path for our valour, and have everywhere planted eternal memorials of our friendship and of our enmity. Such is the city for whose sake these men nobly fought and died. They could not bear the thought that she might be taken from them, and every one of us who survive should gladly toil on her behalf. I would have you, day by day, fix your eyes upon the greatness of Athens, until you become filled with the love of her, 
and when you are impressed by the spectacle of her glory, reflect that this empire has been acquired by men who knew their duty, and had the courage to do it, who, in the hour of conflict, had the fear of dishonour always present to them, and who, if ever they failed in an enterprise, would not allow their virtues to be lost to their country, but freely gave their lives to her, as the fairest offering which they could present at her feast. The sacrifice which they collectively made was individually repaid to them, for they received again and again, each one for himself, a praise which grows not old, and the noblest of all sepulchres. I speak not of that in which their remains are laid, but of that in which their glory survives, and is proclaimed always and on every fitting occasion, both in word and deed. For the whole earth is the sepulchre of famous men. Not only are they commemorated by columns and inscriptions in their own country, but in foreign lands there dwells also an unwritten memorial of them, graven not on stone, but in the hearts of men. Make them your examples. We are reminded of an earlier monument from the middle of the century. A beautiful relief found on the Acropolis shows the helmeted lady of the land leaning on her spear with downcast head and gazing gravely at a slab of stone. It is an attractive interpretation that she is sadly engaged in reading the names of citizens who had recently fallen in the defence of her city, perhaps in the First Peloponnesian War. Next year the Peloponnesians again invaded Attica, and extended their devastations to the south of the peninsula as far as Laurion. But the Athenians concerned themselves less with this invasion. They had to contend with a more awful enemy within the walls of their city. The plague had broken out. Thucydides, who was stricken down himself, gives a terrible account of its ravages and the demoralization which it produced in Athens. The art of medicine was in its first infancy, and the inexperienced physicians were unable to treat the unknown virulent disease which defied every remedy and was aggravated by the overcrowding in the heat of summer. The dead lay unburied, the temples were full of corpses, and the funeral customs were forgotten or violated. Dying wretches were gathered about every fountain, seeking to relieve their unquenchable thirst. Men remembered an old oracle which said that, a Dorian war will come, and a plague therewith. But the Greek for plague, loimos, was hardly distinguishable from the Greek for famine, limos. At the present day they are identical in sound, and people were not quite sure which was the true word. Naturally the verse was now quoted with loimos, but, says Thucydides, in case there comes another Dorian war, and it is accompanied by a famine, the oracle will be quoted with limos. The same historian, who has given of this pestilence a vivid description, unequalled by later narrators of similar scourges, Procopius, Boccaccio, Defoe, declares that the plague originated in Ethiopia, spread through Egypt over the Persian Empire, and then reached the Aegean. But it is remarkable that a plague raged at the same time in the still obscure city of central Italy, which was afterwards to become the mistress of Greece. It has been guessed with some plausibility that the infection which reached both Athens and Rome had travelled along the trade routes from Carthage. The Peloponnesus almost entirely escaped. In Athens the havoc of the pestilence permanently reduced the population. The total number of Athenian burghers, of both sexes and all ages, was about 140,000 in the first quarter of the 5th century. Prosperity had raised it to a 172,000 by the beginning of the war, but the plague brought it down below the old level, which it never reached again. As in a year before, an Athenian fleet attacked the Peloponnesus, but this time it was the coasts of Argolis, Epidaurus, Troisine, Hermione, Haliais. The armament was large, 4,000 spearmen and 300 horse. It was under the command of Pericles, and it aimed at the capture of Epidaurus, while the Epidaurian troops were absent with their allies in Attica. The attempt miscarried, we know not why, and it is hard to forgive our historian for omitting all the details of this ambitious enterprise, which would have been, if it had succeeded, one of the most important exploits of the war. <laughs> 
for Epidaurus occupied an invaluable strategic position. It would have been a useful base for raiding the territory of Corinth and Megara, it would have threatened Peloponnesian armies advancing into Attica, and it might have served as a tempting bait to Argos. For Epidaurus was part of the heritage of Temenos, and its independence was an index of Argive weakness. Should neutral Argos rejoin her old ally, the balance of power would be decisively shifted in Athens' favour. At the end of the summer hostilities broke out in the west of Greece. Before the war, the inhabitants of Amphilochion Argos, driven out by the Ambraciots, had with their allies, the Acarnanians, appealed for help to Athens. Athens had sent Formio with thirty ships to restore the position. The Ambraciots were sold into slavery, and the city restored to Amphilochians and Acarnanians, who became grateful allies. Now, taking advantage of the general unsettlement, the Ambraciots tried to recover the lost ground. But though they overran the countryside, they could not take the city. A show of force by Athens was needed, and Formio was sent with twenty ships to hold guard at Naupactus. From this station he could watch the northwest and guard the entrance to the Chrysaean Gulf. In Thrace, meanwhile, the siege of Potidaea had been prosecuted throughout the year. The inhabitants had been reduced to such straits that they even tasted human flesh, and in the winter they capitulated. The terms were that the Potidaeans and the foreign soldiers were to leave the city, the men with one garment, the women with two, and a sum of money was to be allowed them. Athens soon afterwards colonised the place. The siege had cost two thousand talents. Meanwhile the Athenians had been cast into such despair by the plague that they made overtures for peace to Sparta. Their overtures were rejected, and they turned the fury of their disappointment upon Pericles, who had returned unsuccessful from Epidaurus. He was suspended from the post of Strategos, to which he had been elected in the spring. His accounts were called for and examined by the council, and an exceptionally large court of 1,501 judges was impanelled to try him for the misappropriation of public money. He was found guilty of theft to the trifling amount of five talents. The verdict was a virtual acquittal, though he had to pay a fine of ten times the amount, and he was presently re-elected to the post from which he had been suspended. He was, in truth, indispensable. All the courage, all the patience, all the eloquence of the great statesman were demanded at this crisis. He had to convince Athens that the privileges of her imperial position involved hardships and toils, and that it was dangerous for her to draw back. The position of the imperialist is always vulnerable to assaults on grounds of morality, and the peace party at Athens could make a plausible case against the policy of Pericles. But the imperial instinct of the people responded, in spite of temporary reactions, to his call. Athens was not destined to be guided by him much longer. He had lost his two legitimate sons in the plague, and he died about a year later. In his last years he had been afflicted by the indirect attacks of his enemies. Phidias was accused of embezzling part of the public money devoted to the works on the Acropolis in which he was engaged, and it was implied that Pericles was cognizant of the dishonesty. Phidias was condemned. Then the philosopher Anaxagoras was publicly prosecuted for holding and propagating impious doctrines. Pericles defended his friend, but Anaxagoras was sentenced to pay a fine of five talents, and retired to continue his philosophical studies at Lampsacus. The next attack was upon his mistress, Aspasia, who was charged with impiety. The pleading of Pericles procured her acquittal, and in the last year of his life the people passed a decree to legitimise her son. The latest words of Pericles express what to the student of the history of civilization is an important feature of his character, his humanity. No Athenian ever put on black for an act of mine. End of chapter 10, part 4. This recording is in the public domain. Eight being chapter 10, parts 5 and 6 of the History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnor Bury. Chapter 10, Part 5. The Siege and Capture of Plataea. In the next summer, Archidamus was induced by the Thebans, instead of invading Attica, to march across Cithaeron and lay siege to Plataea. Like Elis itself, the Plataean land was sacred in memory of the great deliverance of Hellas which had been wrought there, and the Spartan king, when he set foot upon it, called the gods to witness that the Plataeans had first done wrong. He proposed to the Plataeans that they should evacuate their territory until the end of the war. They might count their trees and their possessions, and all should then be restored to them intact. Having consulted Athens, which promised to protect them, the Plataeans refused, and Archidamus began the siege. The Athenians, however, were true to the policy of avoiding continental warfare, and notwithstanding their promises, sent no help. Plataea was a very important position for the Peloponnesians to secure. It commanded the road from Megara to Thebes, by which communications between the Peloponnesus and Boeotia could be maintained most easily without entering Attica. The visitor to Plataea must not suppose that the city which Archidamus besieged extended over the entire ground plan which now meets his eye, for he sees the circuit of the city as it existed a century later, occupying the whole surface of the low triangular plateau on which the town stood. The Plataea of Archidamus corresponds probably to the southern and higher part of the space occupied by the later town. The wall of the older Plataea cannot have been much more than a mile long, for the small garrison, four hundred Plataeans and eighty Athenians, could never have maintained a longer line of defence in a place where nature had done almost nothing to assist them. Having surrounded the city with a palisade to prevent any one from getting out, Archidamus employed his army in building a mound against the southern wall. They worked for seventy days and seventy nights. The Plataeans endeavoured to counteract this by raising the height of their own wall opposite the mound by a structure of bricks set in a wooden frame. They protected the workmen by screens of hide against burning arrows. But as the mound rose higher and higher, a new device was tried. They made a hole in the wall underneath, and drew out the earth from the mound. The Peloponnesians met this device by putting into the gap clay packed in baskets of reeds. This could not be drawn away quickly, like the loose earth. Another plan was then devised by the besieged. They dug a subterranean mine under the wall to some distance beneath the mound, and drew the earth away as they had done before. This effectually retarded the progress of the mound, for though the besiegers were numerous, they had to carry the earth from a considerable distance. The Plataeans resorted to yet another device. From the two extremities of that portion of the wall which they had raised in height, they built an inner wall in crescent shape, projecting inwards, so that if the outer wall were taken, the Peloponnesians would have all their labour over again. They also showed ingenuity in frustrating the battering rams which the besiegers brought against the walls. They placed two poles on top of the wall projecting over it. To the ends of these poles they attached a huge beam by means of iron chains. When the engine approached they let go the beam which snapped off the head of the battering ram. The besiegers then made an attempt to set the town on fire. They heaped up faggots along the wall close to the mound, and kindled them with brimstone and pitch. If the prevalent south wind had been blowing down the slopes of the mountain, nothing would have saved the Plataeans from the tremendous conflagration which ensued and rendered the wall unapproachable by the besiegers. When this device failed, the Peloponnesians saw that they would have to blockade Plataea. They built a wall of circumvallation, about a hundred yards from the city, and dug two fosses, one inside and one outside this wall. Then Archidamus left part of his army to maintain the blockade during the winter. The blockaders, of whom about half were Boeotians, established a communication by means of fire signals with Thebes. 
at the end of another year the Plataeans saw that they had no longer any hope of help from Athens, and their food was running short. They determined to make an attempt to escape. The wall of the Peloponnesians looked like a single wall of immense thickness, but it actually consisted of two walls, sixteen feet apart. The middle space, which served as quarters for the garrison, was roofed over, and guard was kept on the roof. Along the top there were battlements on each side, and at every tenth battlement there was a tower, which covered the whole width from wall to wall. There were passages through the middle of the towers, but not at the sides. On wet and stormy nights, the guard used to leave the battlements and retire under the shelter of the towers. The escape was attended with much risk, and less than half the garrison attempted it. The plan was carefully calculated. They determined the height of the wall by counting and recounting the number of layers of bricks in a spot which had not been plastered, and then constructed ladders of exactly the right length. On a dark night, amid rain and storm, they stole out, crossed the inner ditch, and reached the wall unnoticed. They were lightly equipped, and while their right feet were bare, the left were shod, to prevent slipping in the mud. Twelve men, led by Amias, ascended first, near two adjacent towers. They killed the guard in each tower, and secured the passages, which they held until all their companions had mounted and descended on the other side. One of the Plataeans, in climbing up on the roof, knocked a brick from one of the battlements. Its fall was heard, and the alarm was given. All the besiegers came out on the wall, but in the blackness they could not discover what it was, and no one dared to move from his own place. Moreover, the Plataeans in the city distracted their attention by sallying out on the side opposite to that on which their friends were escaping. The Peloponnesians lit their danger signals to Thebes, but this had also been foreseen by the Plataeans, who, by lighting other beacons on their own wall, confused the signals of their enemies. But what the Plataeans had most to fear was an attack from a band of three hundred men, whose duty it was to patrol outside the wall. While the last of the Plataeans were descending, they arrived with lights. They were thus illuminated themselves, and a good mark for the arrows and darts of the Plataeans who were standing along the edge of the outer ditch. This ditch was crossed with difficulty. It was swollen with rain, and had a coat of ice too thin to bear. But all got over safely, except one archer, who was captured on the brink. The escape was perhaps effected on the north side of the city. The fugitives at first took the road to Thebes, to put their pursuers off the scent, but when they had left Plataea about a mile behind them, they struck to the right and reached the road from Thebes to Athens, near Erythrae. Two hundred and twelve men reached Athens. A few more had started, but had turned back before they crossed the wall. This episode is an eminently interesting example of the survival of the fittest, for a melancholy fate awaited those who had not the courage to take their lives in their hands. In the following summer, want of food forced them to capitulate at discretion to the Lacedaemonians. Five men were sent from Sparta to decide their fate, but their fate had already been decided through the influence of Thebes. Each prisoner was merely asked, Have you, in the present war, done any service to the Lacedaemonians or their allies? The form of the question implied the sentence, and it was in vain that the Plataeans appealed to the loyalty of their ancestors to the cause of Hellas in the Persian war, or implored the Lacedaemonians to look upon the sepulchres of their own fathers buried in Plataean land, and honoured every year by Plataea with the customary offerings. They were put to death, two hundred in number, and twenty-five Athenians, and the city was razed to the ground. The Peloponnesians now commanded the road from Megara to Thebes. It is hard to avoid reproaching the Athenians for impolicy in not coming to the relief of their old and faithful ally, and maintaining a position so important for the communication between the Peloponnese and Boeotia. Their failure to bring succour at the beginning of the siege may be explained by their sufferings from the plague which still prevailed, and in the following year a more pressing danger diverted their attention the revolt of a member of their maritime confederacy. Part 6. Revolt of Mytilene Archidamus had invaded Attica for the third time, and had just quitted it, when the news arrived that Mytilene and the rest of Lesbos 
with the exception of Methymna, had revolted. This was a great, and as it might seem to Athens, an unprovoked blow. It was not due to any special grievance. The oligarchical government of Mytilene confessed that the city was always well treated and honoured by Athens. The revolt is all the more interesting and significant on this account. It was a protest of the Hellenic instinct for absolute autonomy against an empire such as the Athenian. The sovereignty of the lesbian cities was limited in regard to foreign affairs. Their relations with other members of the confederacy were subject to control on the part of Athens, and their ships were required for Athenian purposes. Such restraints were irksome, and as they had seen the free allies of Athens, most recently Samos, gradually transformed into subjects, they might fear that this would presently be their own case too. The revolt had been meditated for some years. It was hastened in the end, before all the preparations were made, such as the closing of the harbour of Mytilene by a mole and chain, because the design had been betrayed to Athens by enemies in Methymna and Tenedos. The Athenians, on the first news, sent ships under Cleopides to surprise Mytilene at a festival of Apollo, which all the inhabitants used to celebrate outside the walls. But the Mytileneans received secret intelligence and postponed the feast. The Lesbians had a large fleet, and the Athenians were feeling so severely the effects of the plague and of the war that the rebellion had a good prospect of success if it had been energetically supported by the Peloponnesians. Envoys who were sent to gain their help pleaded the cause of Lesbos at the Olympian Games, which were celebrated this year. At the most august of the Panhellenic festivals, by the banks of the Alpheus, it was a fitting occasion to come forward among the assembled Greeks as champions of the principle of self-government, which it is the glory of Greece to have taught mankind. And as Mytilene had no grievance beyond the general injustice of Athens in imposing external limitations on the autonomy of others, her assertion of that principle carried the greater weight. Lesbos was admitted into the Peloponnesian League, but no assistance was sent. The revolt from Athens was accompanied by a constitutional change within the borders of Lesbos itself. Except Methymna in the north, the other cities in the island, and Tissa, Eresus, and Pyrrha on her landlocked bay, agreed to merge their own political individualities in the city of Mytilene. By the constitutional process, known as cynicism, Mytilene was now to be to Lesbos what Athens was to Attica, the citizens of Pyrrha, Eresus, and Antissa would henceforward be citizens of Mytilene. Lesbos, with Methymna independent and hostile, would now be what Attica was before the annexation of Eleusis. Meanwhile, the Athenians had blockaded the two harbours of Mytilene, and Paci soon arrived with a thousand hoplites to complete the investment. He built a wall on the land side of the city. At this time the Athenians were in sore want of money, for their funds had been seriously strained, especially by the expenses of the siege of Potidaea. As a measure of economy, the hoplites sent from Athens to reinforce the besiegers were required to take the oars themselves. A small squadron was sent at the same time to the Carian district to levy tribute from states which had defaulted, a dangerous mission which met with no success. The tribute of the empire was increased by a new extraordinary assessment, and at home they resorted to the expedient of raising money by a property tax. This tax, now introduced for the first time, differed both in object and in nature from the property tax of the 6th century. In the first place it was not imposed permanently, but only to meet a temporary crisis. Secondly, it was to be used for purely military purposes. Thirdly, it was imposed on all property and not merely on land. Economical conditions had changed since the days of Pisistratus, and landed proprietors no longer formed the bulk of the richest men. The tax yielded in the first year two hundred talents, and was frequently reimposed. The urgent need justified it, but it increased the bitterness of the oligarchs, and helped to strain the allegiance of the moderates. It was probably first introduced by Cleon, who was this year a member of the council. It became associated with the policy of the demagogues. Towards the end of the winter, the Spartans sent a man, his name was Selythus, to assure the people of Mytilene that an armament would be dispatched to their relief. He managed to elude the Athenians and get into the city. 
the spirits of the besieged rose, and when summer came, forty-two ships were sent under the command of Alcidas, and at the same time the Peloponnesians invaded Attica for the fourth time, hoping to distract the attention of the Athenians from Mytilene. The besieged waited and waited, but the ships never came, and the food ran short. Salithus, in despair, determined to make a sally, and for this purpose armed the mass of the people with shields and spears. But the people, when they got the arms, refused to obey, and demanded that the oligarch should bring forth the corn, and that all should share it fairly. Otherwise they would surrender the city. This drove the government to anticipate the chance of a separate negotiation on the part of the people, and they capitulated at discretion. Their fate was to be decided at Athens, and meanwhile Pachys was to put no man to death. The fleet of Alcidas had wasted time about the Peloponnesus, and on reaching the island of Mykonos, received the news that Mytilene was taken. He sailed to Erythrae, and there it was proposed to Alcidas that he should attack Mytilene, on the principle that men who have just gained possession of a city are usually off their guard. Another suggestion was that a town on the Asiatic coast should be seized, and a revolt excited against Athens in the Ionian district. But these plans were far too good and daring for a Lacedaemonian admiral to adopt. He sailed southward, was pursued by Pachys as far as Patmos, and retired into the Peloponnesian waters, where he was more at home. The ringleaders of the revolt of Mytilene were sent to Athens, and along with them the Spartan Salithus, who was immediately put to death. The assembly met to determine the fate of the prisoners, and decided to put to death not only the most guilty who had been sent to Athens, but the whole adult male population, and to enslave the women and children. A trireme was immediately dispatched to Pachys with this terrible command. The fact that the Athenian assembly was persuaded to press the cruel rights of war so far as to decree the extinction of a whole population shows how deep was the feeling of wrath that prevailed against Mytilene. Many things contributed to render that feeling particularly bitter. The revolt had come at a moment when Athens was sore bestead, between plague and the war. Every Athenian had a grudge against Mytilene, for his own pocket had suffered through the tax which it had been necessary to impose, and the imperial pride of the people had been wounded by the unheard-of event of a Peloponnesian fleet sailing in the eastern waters, of which Athens regarded herself as the sole mistress. But above all it was the revolt, not of a subject, but of a free ally. Athens could more easily forgive the rebellion of a subject state which tried to throw off her yoke than repudiation of her leadership by a nominally independent confederate. For the action of Mytilene was in truth an indictment of the whole fabric of the Athenian empire as unjust and undesirable, and the Athenians felt its significance. The mere unreasoning instinct of self-preservation suggested the policy of making a terrible example. It was another question whether this policy was wise. The calm sense of Pericles was no longer there to guide and enlighten the assembly. We now find democratic statesmen of a completely different stamp coming forward to take his place. The assembly is swayed by men of the people, tradesmen like Cleon, the leather merchant, Eucrates, the rope seller, Hyperbolus, the lamp maker, these men had not, like Aristides, Cimon, and Pericles, family connections to start and support them. They had no aristocratic traditions as the background of their democratic policy. They were self-made. They won their influence in the state by sheer force of cleverness, eloquence, industry, and audacity. A man like Cleon, the son of Cleinetus, whom we now meet holding the unofficial position of leader of the assembly, must, to attain that eminence, have regularly attended week after week in the Pnyx. He must have mastered the details of political affairs. He must have had the courage to confront the Olympian authority of Pericles, and the dexterity to make some palpable hits. He must have studied the art of speaking, and been able to hold his audience." Cleon and the other statesmen of this new type are especially interesting as the politicians whom the advanced democracy produced and educated. It would be a grievous error and injustice to suppose that their policy was determined by mere selfish ambition or party malice. 
nearly all we know of them is derived from the writings of men who not only condemned their policy, but personally disliked them as low-born upstarts. Yet, though they may have been vulgar and offensive in their manners, there is abundant evidence that they were able, and there is no proof that they were not generally honest politicians. To those who regretted the dignity of Pericles, the speech of Cleon or Hyperbolus may have seemed violent and coarse, but Cleon himself could hardly have outdone the coarseness and the violence of the personalities which Demosthenes heaped on Aeschines in a subsequent generation. These new politicians were for the most part strong imperialists, and Cleon seems to have taken fully to heart the maxim of Pericles to keep the subject allies well in hand. It was under his influence that the assembly vented its indignation against Mytilene by dooming the whole people to slaughter, but when the meeting had dispersed a partial reaction set in. Men began, in a cooler moment, to realise the inhumanity of their action, and to question its policy. The envoys of Mytilene, who had been permitted to come to Athens to plead her cause, seeing this change of feeling, induced the authorities to summon an extraordinary meeting of the assembly for the following morning, to reconsider the decree. Cleon again came forward to support it, on the grounds of both legal justice and good policy. Thucydides represents him as openly asserting the principle that a tyrannical city must use tyrannical methods, and rule by fear, chastising her allies without mercy. The chief speaker on the other side was a certain Diodotus, whose name has won immortality by his action at this famous crisis. Diodotus handled the question entirely as a matter of policy. Cleon had deprecated any appeal to the irrelevant considerations of humanity or pity. Diodotus, carefully avoiding such an appeal, deprecates on his own side with great force Cleon's appeal to considerations of justice. The Mytilineans have deserved the sentence of death, certainly, but the argument is entirely irrelevant. The question for Athens to consider is not what Mytilene deserves, but what it is expedient for Athens to inflict. We are not at law with the Mytilineans, and do not want to be told what is just. We are considering a matter of policy, and desire to know how we can turn them to account. He then goes on to argue that as a matter of fact the penalty of death is not a deterrent, and that the result of such a severe punishment will be injurious to Athens. A city which has revolted, knowing that whether she comes to terms soon or late the penalty will be the same, will never surrender. Money will be wasted in a long blockade, and when the place is taken, it will be a mere wreck. Moreover, if the people of Mytilene, who were compelled to join with their oligarchical government in rebelling, are destroyed, the popular party will everywhere be alienated from Athens. The reasoning of Diodotus, which was based on sound views of policy, must have confirmed many of the audience who had already been influenced by the emotion of pity. But even still the assembly was nearly equally divided, and the supporters of Diodotus won their motion by a very small majority. The ship which bore the sentence of doom had a start of about a day and a night. Could it be overtaken by the trireme which was now dispatched with the reprieve? The Mytilenean envoys supplied the crew with wine and barley, and offered large rewards if they were in time. The oarsmen continued rowing while they ate the barley kneaded with wine and oil, and slept and rowed by turns. The first trireme, bound on an unpleasant errand, had sailed slowly. It arrived a little before the other. Pakis had the decree in his hand, and was about to execute it, when the second ship sailed into the harbour, and the city was saved. The wrath of Athens against her rebellious ally was sufficiently gratified by the trial and execution of those Mytilineans who had been sent to Athens as especially guilty. Having taken away the lesbian fleet and raised the wall of Mytilene, the Athenians divided the island, excluding Methymna, into three thousand lots, of which three hundred were consecrated to the gods. The rest they let to Athenian citizens as clerics and the land was cultivated by the lesbians, who paid an annual rent. End of Part 6 This recording is in the public domain.
thirty nine being chapter ten parts seven, eight, and nine of a history of Greece to the death of Alexander the Great, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 10, Part 7. Warfare in Western Greece, Tragic Events in Corcyra. While the attention of Greece was directed upon the fortunes of Plataea and Mytilene, warfare had been carried on in the regions of the West and the reputation of the Athenian navy had risen higher. The Ambraciots had persuaded Sparta to send an expedition against Acarnania. If the Peloponnesians firmly established themselves there, they might win the whole Athenian alliance in the west. Cnemus was sent with a thousand hoplites in advance. He made an attempt on the important town of Stratus, but was forced to retreat. Meanwhile, a Peloponnesian fleet was to sail from Corinth to support him. It consisted of forty-seven ships, and had to pass Formio, who was guarding the entrance of the Corinthian Gulf, with only twenty. Formio let them sail into the open sea, preferring to attack them there. By skilful manoeuvres, he crowded the enemy's ships into a narrow space. A morning breeze helped him by knocking the ships against one another and when they were in confusion the athenians dashed in and gained a complete victory the government at sparta could not understand how skill could gain such an advantage over far superior numbers they sent commissioners to make an inquiry and cnemus was told that he must try again and be successful a reorganized peloponnesian fleet took up a position at panormus in achaea and formio was stationed at rion on the opposite coast the object of Cnemus was to lure or drive the enemy into the gulf, where their skill in handling their ships would be less decisive than in the open sea. With this purpose he sailed towards Naupactus, and Formio, in alarm, sailed along the coast to protect the place. As the Athenian ships moved near the land in single file, the enemy suddenly swung round and rode down upon them at their utmost speed. The eleven ships which were nearest Naupactus had time to run round the right Peloponnesian wing and escape. The rest were driven aground. Twenty Peloponnesian vessels on the right were in the meantime pursuing the eleven Athenian, which were making for Naupactus. A Leucadian ship was far in advance of the others, closely pursuing an Athenian which was lagging behind. Near Naupactus a merchant vessel lay in their way, anchored in the deep water. The Athenian trireme rode round it, struck her pursuer amidships, and sank her. This brilliant exploit startled the Peloponnesians, who were coming up singing a paean of victory. The front ships dropped oars and waited for the rest. The Athenians, who had already reached now Pactus, saw the situation, and immediately bore down and gained another complete victory. If this able admiral Formio had lived, he might have extended Athenian influence considerably in western Greece, but after a winter expedition which he made in Acarnania, he suddenly drops out of history, and, as we find his son Asopius sent out in the following summer at the request of the Acarnanians, we must conclude that his career had been cut short by death. Asopius made an unsuccessful attempt on Oeniadae, and was slain in a descent on Lucas. The peninsula of Lucas and the Acarnanian Oeniadae, girt by morasses at the mouth of the river Achelous, were two main objectives of Athenian enterprise in the west. Lucas was never won, but four years later Oeniadae was forced to join the Athenian alliance. Corcyra herself was to be the next scene of war in the Ionian Sea. The prisoners whom Corinth had taken in the Epidamnian War had been released on the understanding that they were to win over Corcyra from the Athenian alliance, and their intrigues were effectual in dividing the state and producing a sanguinary revolution. The question between the Peloponnesian and the Athenian alliance was closely bound up with the cleavage between the oligarchical and the democratic party. 
The intriguers in the Corinthian interest and their faction formed a conspiracy to overthrow the democratic constitution. Their first step was to prosecute Patheas, the leader of the people, on the charge of scheming to make Corcyra a subject of Athens. He was acquitted, and retorted by summoning their five richest men to take their trial for cutting vine poles in the sanctuaries of Zeus and Alcinous. They were fined a stator for each pole, such a heavy fine that the culprits sat as suppliants in the sanctuary, imploring that they might pay by instalments. The prayer was refused, and in desperation they rushed into the senate house and slew Patheas and sixty others who were with him. The oligarchy now had the upper hand, and they attacked the people who fled to the Acropolis and the Helaic harbour. The other harbour, which looks towards the mainland, along with the Agora and the lower parts of the city, were held by the oligarchs. Next day reinforcements came to both sides, to the people from other parts of the island, and to the oligarchs from the mainland. Fighting was soon resumed, and the people had the advantage. In order to bar their way to the arsenal, the oligarchs set fire to the houses and buildings in the neighbourhood of the Agora. Next day twelve Athenian ships under Nicostratus arrived from Naupactus. He induced the two parties to come to an agreement, but the Democrats persuaded him to leave five Athenian ships to ensure the preservation of order, for they did not trust their opponents. Nicostratus was to take five Corcyrian ships instead, and the crews of them were chosen from the oligarchs. They were in fact to be hostages for the behaviour of their fellows, but they feared they might be sent to Athens and fled to the refuge of a temple. Nicostratus could not induce them to stir. The people regarded this distrust as a proof of criminal designs, and armed anew. The rest of the oligarchs then fled to the temple of Hera, but the democrats induced them to cross over to an islet off the coast. Four or five days later a Peloponnesian fleet of fifty-three ships arrived under Alcidas, who had just returned from his expedition to Ionia. In a naval engagement outside the harbour, the Corcyreans fought badly, and the Athenians were forced to retreat. But the Peloponnesians did not follow up their success, and soon afterwards, hearing that an Athenian armament of sixty ships was on its way, returned home. The Democratic Party was now in a position to wreak vengeance on its foes, who had gratuitously disturbed the peace of the city, and sought to submit it to the yoke of its ancient enemy. The most vindictive and inhuman passions had been roused in the people by the attempt of the oligarchs on their liberty, and they now gave vent to these passions without regard to honour or policy. The four hundred suppliants had returned from the island, and were again under the protection of Hera. Fifty of them were persuaded to come forth to take their trial, and were executed. The rest, seeing their fate, aided each other in committing suicide. Some hung themselves on the trees in the sacred enclosure. Eurymedon arrived with the Athenian fleet, and remained seven days. During this time the Corcyreans slew all whom they suspected of being opposed to the democracy, and many victims were sacrificed to private enmity. Every form of death was to be seen, and everything, and more than everything, that commonly happens in revolutions, happened then. The father slew the son, and the suppliants were torn from the temples and slain near them. Some of them were even walled up in the temple of Dionysus, and there perished. To such extremes of cruelty did revolution go, and this seemed to be the worst of revolutions, because it was the first. Eurymedon looked on, and did not intervene. While the democracy cannot be excused for these horrible excesses, the fact remains that the guilt of causing the revolution rests entirely with the oligarchs. The chief victims of the democratic fury deserve small compassion. They had set the example of violence. The occurrences at Corcyra made a profound impression in Greece, reflected in the pages of Thucydides. That historian has used the episode as the text for deep comments on the revolutionary spirit which soon began to disturb the states of the Greek world. Party divisions were encouraged and aggravated by the hope or fear of foreign intervention, the oligarchs looking to the Lacedaemonians and the Democrats to the Athenians. In time of peace these party struggles would have been far less bitter, this acute observation is illustrated by a famous modern instance, the French Revolution, 
where the worst outrages of the revolutionists were provoked by foreign intervention. In that great revolution, too, we can verify the Greek historian's analysis of the effect of the revolutionary spirit, when it runs wild, on the moral nature of men. The revolutionists, determined to outdo the report of all who had preceded them by the ingenuity of their enterprises and the activity of their revenges. The meaning of words had no longer the same relation to things, but was changed by them as they thought proper. Reckless daring was held to be loyal courage. Prudent delay was the excuse of a coward. Moderation was the disguise of unmanly weakness. To know everything was to do nothing. Frantic energy was the true quality of a man. The lover of violence was always trusted, and his opponent suspected. It was dangerous to be quiet and neutral. The citizens, who were of neither party, fell a prey to both. Either they were disliked because they held aloof, or men were jealous of their surviving. The laws of heaven, as well as of civilized societies, were set aside without scruple, amid the impatience of party spirit, the zeal of contention, the eagerness of ambition, and the cravings of revenge. These are some of the features in the delineation which Thucydides has drawn of the diseased condition of political life in the city-states of Greece. But the sequel of the Corcyrian revolution has still to be recorded. About six hundred of the oligarchs, who escaped the vengeance of their opponents, established themselves on Mount Istone, in the northeast of the island, and easily becoming masters of the open country, they harassed the inhabitants of the city for two years. Then an Athenian fleet, of which the ultimate destination was Sicily, under the command of Eurymedon and Sophocles, arrived at Corcyra, and the Athenians helped the democrats to storm the fort on Mount Istone. The oligarchs capitulated on condition that the Athenian people should determine how they were to be dealt with. The generals placed them in the island of Tukia, on the understanding that if any of their number attempted to escape, all should be deprived of the benefit of the previous agreement. But the democrats apprehended that the prisoners would not be put to death at Athens, and they were determined that their enemies should die. A foul trick was planned and carried out. Friends of the prisoners were sent over to the island, who said that the generals had resolved to leave them to the mercy of the democrats, and advised them to escape, offering to provide a ship. A few of the captives fell into the trap, and were caught starting. All the prisoners were immediately handed over to the Corcyreans, who shut them up in a large building. They were taken out in batches of twenty, and made to march, tied together, down an avenue of hoplites, who smote and wounded any whom they recognized as a personal enemy. Three batches had thus marched to execution, when their comrades in the building, who thought they were merely being removed to another prison, discovered the truth. They called on the Athenians, but they called in vain. Then they refused to stir out of the building, or let any one enter. The Corcyrians did not attempt to force their way in. They tore off the roof, and hurled bricks and shot arrows from above. The captives, absolutely helpless, began to anticipate the purpose of their tormentors by taking their own lives, piercing their throats with the arrows which were shot down, or strangling themselves with the ropes of some beds which were in the place, or with strips of their own dress. The work of destruction went on during the greater part of the night. All was over when the day dawned, and the corpses were carried outside the city. Thus ended the Corcyrian Revolution and the last scene was more ghastly even than the first. Eurymedon had less excuse on this occasion for refusing to intervene than he had two years before, since the prisoners had surrendered to the Athenians. It was said that he and Sophocles were ready to take advantage of the base trick of the democrats, because, unable to take the captives to Athens themselves, being bound for Sicily, they could not bear that the credit should fall to another. The oligarchical faction at Corcyra was now utterly annihilated, and the Democrats lived in peace. Part 8. Campaigns of Demosthenes in the West During the Corcyrian troubles, the war had not rested in western Greece. An Athenian fleet under the general Demosthenes had sailed round the Peloponnesus and attacked the island of Lucas. 
Demosthenes was an enterprising commander, distinguished from most of his fellows by a certain originality of conception. On this occasion, the idea of making a great stroke induced him to abandon the operations at Lucas, though the Arcananians thought he might have taken the town by blockade, and engage in a new enterprise on the north of the Corinthian Gulf. Most of the lands between Boeotia and the Western Sea, Phocis, Locris, Acarnania, were friendly to Athens, but the hostility of the uncivilized Aetolians rendered land operations in those regions dangerous. Demosthenes conceived the plan of reducing the Aetolians so that he could then operate from the west on Doris and Boeotia, without the danger of his communications being threatened in the rear. His idea, in fact, was to bring the Corinthian Gulf into touch with the Euboean Sea. The Spartans, it is to be observed, were at this very time concerning themselves with the regions of Mount Eta. The appeals of Doris on the south and Trachis on the north of the Aetean range for protection against the hostilities of the mountain tribes induced the Lacedaemonians to send out a colony which was established in Trachis, not very far from the pass of Thermopylae, under the name of Heraclea. A colony was an unusual enterprise for Sparta, but Heraclea had a more important significance and intention than the mere defence of members of the Amphictyony. It was a place from which Euboea could be attacked, and it might prove of the greatest service as an intermediate station for carrying on operations in the Chalcidic Peninsula. The fears which the foundation of Heraclea excited at Athens were indeed disappointed. Heraclea never flourished. It was incessantly assailed by the powerful hostility of the Thessalians, and its ruin was completed by the flagrantly unjust administration of the Lacedaemonian governors. But its first foundation was a serious event, and it seems highly probable that Demosthenes, when he formed his plan, had before his mind the idea of threatening Heraclea from the south by the occupation of Doris. But his plan, attractive as it might sound, was eminently impracticable. The preliminary condition was the subjugation of a mountainous country, involving a warfare in which Demosthenes was inexperienced, and hoplites were at a great disadvantage. The Messenians of Naupactus represented to him that Aetolia, a land of unwalled villages, could easily be reduced. But the Messenians had their own game to play. They suffered from the hostilities of their Aetolian neighbours, and wanted to use the ambition of the Athenian general for their own purpose. The Acarnanians, who were deeply interested in the defeat of Lucas, were indignant with Demosthenes for not prosecuting the blockade, and refused to join him against Aetolia. Starting from Inion in Locris, the Athenians and some allies, not a large force, advanced into the country, hoping to reduce several tribes before they had time to combine. But the Aetolians had already learnt his plans, and were already collecting a great force. The main chance of Demosthenes lay in the cooperation of the Ozolian Locrians, who knew the Aetolian country and mode of warfare, and were armed in the Aetolian fashion. Demosthenes committed the error of not waiting for them. He was constantly unable to deal with the Aetolian javelin men. At Aegition, rushing down from the hills, they wrought havoc among the invaders who had captured the town. A hundred and twenty Athenian hoplites fell, the very finest men whom the city of Athens lost during the war. Demosthenes did not dare to return to Athens. He remained at Naupactus, and soon had an opportunity of retrieving his fame. The Lacedaemonians answered this invasion of Aetolia by sending three thousand hoplites under Eurylochus against Naupactus. Five hundred of these troops came from Heraclea, the newly founded colony. Naupactus, ill defended, was barely saved by the energy of Demosthenes, who persuaded the Acarnanians to send reinforcements. Eurylochus abandoned the siege and withdrew to the neighbourhood of Calydon and Pleuron in southern Aetolia for the purpose of joining the Ambraciots in an attack upon Argus. Winter had begun when the Ambraciots descended from the north into the Argive territory and seized the fort of Olpi, which stands a little north of Argos on a hill by the sea and was once used as a hall of justice by the Acarnanian League. Demosthenes was asked by the Acarnanians to be their leader in resisting this attack, 
and a message for help was sent to twenty Athenian vessels, which were coasting off the Peloponnesus. The troops of Eurylochus marched from the south across Acarnania, and joined their allies at Olpi. The Athenian ships arrived in the Ambracian Gulf, and with the reinforcements which they brought, Demosthenes gave battle to the enemy between Olpi and Argos, and by a skilfully contrived ambuscade, annulled the advantage which they had in superior numbers. Eurylochus was slain, and the Peloponnesians delivered themselves from their perilous position between Argus and the Athenian ships, by making a secret treaty with Demosthenes, in which the Ambraciots were not included. It was arranged that they should retreat stealthily, without explaining their intention to the Ambraciots. It was good policy on the part of Demosthenes, for by this treacherous act the Lacedaemonians would lose their character in that part of Greece. The Peloponnesians crept out of Olpi one by one, pretending to gather herbs and sticks. As they got farther away, they stepped out more quickly, and then the Ambraciots saw what was happening and ran to overtake them. The Acarnanians slew about two hundred Ambraciots, and the Peloponnesians escaped into the land of Agria. But a heavier blow was in store for Ambracia. Reinforcements of that city, ignorant of the battle, were coming to Olpi. Demosthenes sent forward some of his troops to lie in ambush on their line of march. At Idomene, some miles north of Olpi, there are two peaks of unequal height. The hire was seized in advance by the men of Demosthenes. The Ambraciots, when they arrived, encamped on the lower. Demosthenes then advanced with the rest of his troops, and attacked the enemy at dawn, when they were still half asleep. Most were slain, and those who escaped at first found the mountain paths occupied. Thucydides says that during the first ten years of the war, no such calamity happened within so few days to any Hellenic state, and he does not give the numbers of those who perished, because they would appear incredible in proportion to the size of the state. Demosthenes might have captured the city if he had pushed on, but the Acarnanians did not desire a permanent Athenian occupation at their doors. They were content that their neighbour was rendered harmless. A treaty of alliance for one hundred years was concluded between the Acarnanians with the Amphilochians of Argos and the Ambraciots. Neither side was to be required by the other to join against its own allies in the Great War, but they were to help each other to defend their territories. Sometimes afterwards, Anactorion, then Oeniadae, were won over to the Athenian alliance. Part 9. Nicias and Cleon. Politics at Athens. The success against Ambracia compensated for the failure in Aetolia, and Demosthenes could now return to Athens. His dashing style of warfare and his bold plans must have caused grave mistrust among the older, more experienced and more commonplace commanders. Nicias, the son of Nicaratus, who seems to have already won, without deserving, the chief place as a military authority at Athens, must have shaken his head over the doings of Demosthenes in the west. Nicias, a wealthy conservative slave-owner, who speculated in the silver mines of Laurion, was one of the mainstays of that party which was out of sympathy with the intellectual and political progress of Athens, and bitterly opposed to the new politicians like Cleon, who wielded the chief influence in the assembly. The ability of Nicias was irretrievably mediocre. He would have been an excellent subordinate officer, but he had not the qualities of a leader or a statesman. Yet he possessed a solid and abiding influence at Athens, through his impregnable respectability, his superiority to bribes, and his scrupulous superstition, as well as his acquaintance with the details of military affairs. This homage paid to a mediocre respectability throws light on the character of the Athenian democracy and the strength of the Conservative Party. Nicias belonged to the advocates of peace and was well disposed to Sparta, so that for several reasons he might be regarded as a successor to Cimon. But his political opponents, though they constantly defeated him on particular measures, never permanently undermined his influence. He understood the political value of gratifying in small ways those prejudices of his fellow citizens which he shared himself, and he spared no expense in the religious service of the state. 
as Thucydides says, he thought too much of divination and omens. He had an opportunity of displaying his religious devotion and his liberality on the occasion of the purification of Delos, which was probably undertaken to induce Apollo to avert a recurrence of the plague. The dead were removed from all the tombs, and it was ordained that henceforth no one should die or give birth to a child on the sacred island. Those who were near to either should cross over to Renea. The Athenians revived in a new form the old festival, celebrated in the Homeric hymn to Apollo, the festival to which the long-robed Ionians gathered, and made thee glad, O Phoebus, with boxing, dancing, and song. The games were restored, and horse races introduced for the first time. Four years later the purification was perfected by the removal of all the inhabitants, and the Persians accorded them a refuge at Adramition. Conducting such ceremonies, Nicias was in his right place. Unfortunately, such excellence had an undue weight, and it should be noted that this is one of the drawbacks of a city-state. In a large modern state, the private life and personal opinions of a statesman have small importance, and are not weighed by his fellow countrymen in the scale against his political ability, save in rare exceptional cases. But in a small city, the statesman's private life is always before men's eyes, and his political position is distinctly affected, according as he shocks or gratifies their prejudices and predilections. A mediocre man is able by judicious conforming, to attain an authority to which his brains give him no claim. Pericles was indeed so strong that his influence could survive attacks on his morality and his orthodoxy. Nicias maintained his position because he never shocked the public sense of decorum and religion by associating with an Aspasia or an Anaxagoras. The Athenian people combined in a remarkable degree the capacity of appreciating both respectability and intellectual power. Their progressive instinct was often defeated by conservative prejudices. Though Nicias was one of those Athenians who were not in full sympathy with the policy of Pericles, and approved still less of the policy of his successors, he was thoroughly loyal to the democracy. But an oligarchical party still existed, secretly active, and always hoping for an opportunity to upset the democratic constitution. This party, or a section of it, seems to have been known at this time as the Young Party. It included, among others who will appear on the stage of history some years later, the orator Antiphon, who was now coming into public notice in connection with some sensational lawsuits. Against the dark designs of this party, as well as against the misconduct of generals, Cleon was constantly on the watch. He could describe himself in the assembly as the people's watchdog. But at present these oligarchs were harmless. So long as no disaster from without befell Athens, they had no chance. All they could do was to make common cause with the other enemies of Cleon, and air their discontent in anonymous political pamphlets. Chance has preserved us a work of this kind, written in one of these years by an Athenian of oligarchical views. Its subject is the Athenian democracy, and the writer professes to answer, on behalf of the Athenians, the criticisms which the rest of the Greeks pass on Athenian institutions. I do not like democracy myself, he says, but I will show that from their point of view the Athenians manage their state wisely and in the manner most conducive to the interests of democracy. The defence is for the most part a veiled indictment. It displays remarkable acuteness with occasional triviality. The writer has grasped and taken to heart one deep truth, the close connection of the sea power of Athens with its advanced democracy. It is just, he remarks, that the poor and the common folk should have more influence than the noble and rich, for it is the common folk that row the ships and make the city powerful, not the hoplites and the well-born and the worthy. Highly interesting is his observation that slaves and metics enjoyed what he considered unreasonable freedom and immunity at Athens. Why, you may not strike one of them, nor will a slave make way for you in the streets, and his malicious explanation is interesting too. The common folk dress so badly that you might easily mistake one of them for a slave or a metic, and then there would be a to-do if you struck a citizen. 
There is perhaps a touch of malice, too, in the statement that the commercial empire of Athens, which brought to her wharves the delicacies of the world, was affecting her language, as well as her habits of life, and filling it with foreign words. An important feature in the political history of Athens in these years was the divorce of the military command from the leadership in the assembly, and the want of harmony between the chief strategoi and the leaders of the people. The tradesmen who swayed the assembly had no military training or capacity, and they were always at a disadvantage when opposed by men who spoke with the authority of a strategos on questions of military policy. Until recent years the post of general had been practically confined to men of property and good family, but a change ensued, perhaps soon after the death of Pericles, and men of the people were elected. The comic poet Eupolis, in a play called The Deems, in which the great leaders Miltiades and Themistocles, Aristides and Pericles, are summoned back to life that they may see and deplore degenerate Athens, meditates thus on the contrast between the latter-day generals and their predecessors. Men of lineage fair and of wealthy estate, once our generals were, the noble and the great, whom as the gods we adored, and as gods they guided and guarded the state. Things are not as then, ah, how different far, a manner of men our new generals are, the rascals and refuse our city now chooses to lead us to war. Cleon was a man of brains and resolution. Hitherto his main activity had been in the law courts, where he called officers to account and maintained the safeguards of popular government. If he was to be more than an opposition leader, he must be ready to undertake the post of strategos, and supported by the experience of an able colleague, he need not disgrace himself. An understanding, therefore, between Cleon and the enterprising Demosthenes was one which seemed to offer advantages to both. Acting together, they might damage both the political and the military position of Nicias. But before we pass to a famous enterprise which was probably the result of such an understanding, we must note the great cost which the continuation of the war entailed. More than four thousand talents had already been borrowed from the temple treasures, and though steps had been taken to increase revenue when Lesbos revolted, the drain was continuing, and the end was not in sight. Cleon seems to have been particularly concerned with the financing of the war, and it was no doubt under his influence that it was decided to strengthen the position at the expense of the Allies. The decree providing for the new assessment was passed in the Assembly after the dramatic success at Sphacteria, but the main lines had probably been worked out by Cleon earlier. We possess numerous fragments of the stone recording the decree, and below it the list of cities with their new assessment. The main character is clear. Since the tribute has become too small, they, the jurors, shall join with the council in making the current assessments. They shall not assess a lower tribute on any city than it was paying before, unless, because of impoverishment of the country, there is a manifest inability to pay more. These instructions were faithfully followed. Many cities had their tribute doubled or trebled. Few escaped increase. Cities that had long discontinued payment were included, and more than one hundred names were added of cities which are not known to have paid before, including a large group of cities in the Euxine and the stubborn island of Milos. The total of the assessment by these drastic measures was increased to nearly 1,500 talents. But this total is in part illusory, for many of the cities waited on events, and in the following years Athens was not able to display the necessary force overseas. Borrowings, though on a reduced scale, had to continue. A sharp increase in tribute was necessary to maintain the offensive, but it was an act of ruthless imperialism. It increased discontent among the Allies, who found sympathy from some of Cleon's opponents in Athens. While the Allies were to be more heavily burdened, Cleon raised the juror's fee from two to three obols. It would be a mistake to consider this measure a mere bid for popularity. We shall hardly be wrong in regarding it as an attempt to relieve the distress which the yearly invasions of Attica and the losses of the harvests inflicted upon the poorer citizens. End of part nine.